Hi, I'm Heinbach. It's good to have you back. A while ago, I visited the Media Archaeological Fundus at the Humboldt University, and it was a rather amazing experience to me to see all these beautiful pieces of rare gear and instruments lined up. There are more beautiful things hidden inside this building. The Signallabor, curated by Dr. Stefan Hölken, is a place where vintage computing has a home. You can find all kinds of analog and early digital computers there, including the only game console made in the GDR, and we'll play a game of tennis on a Telefunken analog computer later on. And I got a little challenge for you, so stay tuned till the end if you want a chance to win one of five copies of Wires, the plugin that I made together with AudioThing. So, enjoy. This is the um, Signal Laboratory, which is a kind of sister lab to the Media Archaeological Fundus. And this is the place we are working with mostly digital computers and digital tools, digital history, um, like home computers from the 70s and the 80s, mini computers from the 60s, analog computers from the 70s. One difference uh, to the um, media archaeological fundus is that everything here in this room works, works properly in the, sometimes not mo anymore in the, in the way it was meant since we modify, we hack them. Since this was my research project, I just finished on early microcomputers and how they are used in the retro computing scenes as tools for arts and tools for hacking and learning about IT. And this is uh, um, the place where also my teaching happens, where the people have to learn programming, like assembly languages for old 8-bit and 16-bit machines. And, and last year we had a, um, a seminar on sound chips, uh, where the um, students had to program different sound chips to make an orchestration uh, and bring them to the stage. And um, this is also a place where people from Berlin regularly meet one or two times a month um, to um, repair historic computers, to learn about them, to show. It's a kind of, it's a kind of round table we are doing here. Um, but uh, here are uh, things built, um, uh, new computers built, uh, new historic computers built with historic architectures and programs. And a lot of computer gaming, since these, as you probably know, these platforms here are mostly used for, had been used for gaming. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, learn about and teach and analyze computer games, but not from the cultural point of view, like the aesthetics or the topics of the games, but from the technological point of view, like how uh, how interrupts are used to, to gain interacti interactivity between the system and the user. Um, this is the kind of, um, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of media science or media studies we are doing here since it's more concerned with the materiality of media, not with the discourses and the aesthetics. Um, but the outcome mostly is a discourse or, or an aesthetic since if you program a computer game then there will be aesthetics on the screen. But we know other things about these aesthetics. Like, like this is the, the, the only German-made gaming console from 1978, Intertone VC4000. One of our students uh, made, a, made a project where he um, built this cartridge, where you could now put an SD card in this 1978 console to load your games from an SD card, and the games you could download from the internet and put it on the SD card. And um, this is, uh, yeah, you can call it uh, software preservation. So we kind of invented this thing from from scratch um, to to use modern tools and to confront this historical technology with modern technology. And this is the idea of retro computing. I never knew there was a German game console. Yeah. This is an original cartridge for the game from like 1981 or so. You could buy them for 70 D marks back in the day. And there had been uh, 36 of these games. This is the last one. And then the um, manufacturer stopped the development of this console and got back to the, his hearing uh, um, gadgets. Mm. Some of these cartridges are very seldom since they have not been sold very much and some, most of them are lost. So you get high prices for these original ones and it's a need for the original software if you want to learn from software history and from gaming history. So the building of such a 
multi-ROM device, this is the name, um, uh, is made for nearly every historical game console, but not for this one. Uh, so we thought we build our own. If I put a, the original game into it and start it, then you will see there's a, yeah, this is a backgammon game. Um, interesting parts in it. Uh, there are shooting games as well and racing games and I just grabbed one from the box. But there's only one game on this uh, cassette and you have to get it off and put another one in uh, if you'd like to get more games. And then, as I said, we built this one where we put every game on this SD card and now you can you can choose um, the game you like. Um, program the first game, and now I've got the car racing game. Or a maze game. Go. And then you can just regularly play it and you control it. Regularly play them. And um, uh, the most interesting thing is, um, yeah, is there a game 37? Let's see. There is. Um, the people started to program new games for the console when the, this, this thing arrived. So there are two games last uh, programmed last year okay. for the console. And uh, it's, uh, I have to clean the, clean the, the electronics. Ah, you're probably the best qualified person to ask that. Yep. Is it okay to blow on Nintendo on the cartridges or not? Absolutely okay, but it doesn't help anything. Okay. <laughs> Since most if, if, if the dust on these uh, um, connectors isn't isn't the problem. The problem is that the there are um, uh, a copper claws in the thing that has been bent two way apart uh, over the decades. You have to go with the screwdriver and bend them back very carefully and then you will get uh, you will get a better result but you can blow so uh, this place has been has become a bit uh, famous for this repairing things and for as we have got students who are very good in electronics and can uh, repair and build uh, things from scratch and uh, do it uh, like like also didactics learns learning by doing and um, so this is why we got donations with computers, with, with somehow defective computers. Uh, here you can get it, if you can repair it, it's yours. And most of these machines are uh, either bought on eBay as defective or are donations, defective not, uh, donations. And to repair them is not only to get, a, to get a repaired computer, but to learn from them. As I said earlier, the error in the machine is the thing you can learn from. So if there's a glitch or it's a hardware bug or another kind of error, by repairing the machine, you can learn from the past. You can learn from the engineers who did this in the 70s and wonder how get a machine like this with only 37 bytes of RAM. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and um, um, uh, how to program them, and uh, if you try, if you're writing a test program, then you learn about the graphics and the sound system and so on. Um, so it's um, um, when the system finally is working again, then it starts to become slightly uninteresting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That computer over there, I just saw that there's a Raspberry... Isn't there a Raspberry Pi this emulation one? of this one? Yes. Yeah, th uh, this is... Uh, uh, this, these are so-called mini-computers from the 60s, but these machines are from the 70s, um, but the, the architecture is from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. These are mini-computers from Digital Equipment Corporation, short DAC. This is a PDP-11 computer with a disk drive. Mm -hmm. This is a PDP-8 computer. And this PDP-8 computer got a... Uh, I've got an uh, extension with uh, an, uh, um, a Raspberry Pi, which is used as a mass storage to boot from and to to, uh, to programming languages and operating systems. These two are working too, but they are very heavy machines, very loud machines. If you switch them on, then it's, I can switch the PDP-8 on and then you will hear. Um, it's a noisy machine. And then he put, and this is an interesting thing for audio uh, guys, then he um, switched in with these binary switches a program 
um, that, if it runs, produces an electromagnetic field around the machine where you could put a radio on it and hear a song in it. Yeah, that was where I was really curious about that one because I heard the radio pickup sound from yeah, this. Yeah. I was really curious about this computer and then I realized there's a... because this, it sounded great, yeah. just really unique. But then, and then I saw there's a Raspberry Pi version of this, I think. Yeah, and with this Raspberry Pi version, you can't do that. You can't do that, so I, I immediately so, lost interest. So, so this is the difference between the original machine and the emulation, which is a very interesting point of um, epistemological theory. Um, what's the difference between emulation and the, and the original thing? Sometimes um, the em emulator is less than the original thing. Sometimes it's more than the original machine, since with many emulators you can double the speed of a system, you can put more memory, like, like gigabytes of memory, into, the, into a system which hasn't been on the market in the 1970s. But when it comes to physical effects, then emulation always loses. Always loses, and there are things you can't emulate, like analog compacts, like analog computers can't be emulated. But that's why we don't, uh, we, we have to, we have to save old machinery, and we don't, uh, try to get rid of it and replace it with emulators since um, there are many undetected features and, and things to explore in old machinery which you can't explore by a software um, f f software emulator. From a software em emulator you can learn what the program of this emulation knew about the system. You can't learn anything about the system. This is the Analog System LabKit Pro from Texas Instruments um, we bought in 2013 or 2014. Um, this is a modern analog, com uh, analog calculator um, which you can buy for I think 100 bucks um, with, with uh, cable and manuals and experimentation schematics here. You can put your own analog graphs into it. And uh, yeah, and you can experiment with that and learn uh, about analog electronic. So the people who want to start with analog computing and analog electronics are uh, should buy this one or a, a thing like this one. Uh, yeah, it's a good alternative for like something to get into this because yeah, it's super rare to get like a working analog computer now and expensive yeah. and unless you get it like gifted from university it's, it's a bit or something. It's comparable with the Leibold Heroes um, as an experimentation and learning tool. Okay, um, the last thing um, here is uh, an analog computer. I think it's from 1970. The Telefunken uh, RR742. That's a German uh, analog computer which has been produced by order. So you, if you wanted to, an analog computer, you couldn't go to the shop and buy one, but you called Telefunken and they made one for you. But it, they made always the same one. Not, it's not like with Bernd Ullmann who can, where, where you can get specific variations. Yeah, this one stems from the Department of Physics. They donated it to us. Um, they didn't uh, uh, need it anymore. And it works properly um, with an oscilloscope. This is the computer itself, and this is a digital, a digital expander to the computer. Um, uh, we managed to, to uh, 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 reenact the Tennis for Two game. It took like a year to do that, uh, since we have to learn about how to program an analog computer, which is completely different from digital computers. You have to know about mathematics and electronics and not about programming, so you can't learn it from the computer science, you have to learn it from the electrical engineering guys. So here is the Tennis for Two, um, which is a Tennis für Drei, since um, we, we need a third person who watches uh, uh, the rules um, and counts the, counts the points. But um, this is built-in physics. It's, it's a physical analogy, uh, built-in electronics for this analog computer. And um, just like the 1958 version from a ball in a box simulation. Sadly, that was all the time I had at the Signallabor. Usually I would have liked to stay around and yeah, make music with one of these machines, but that is where you come in. I recorded the sound of the Telefunken analog computer and I think it sounds beautiful.
I'm going to put a link to download this sound in the description and I want you to make music with that. If you have recorded something you would like to share and get the chance to win one of five copies of Wires, post it to Instagram and follow at AudioThing and at Heinbach101 and tag us when you post it and use this hashtag. The winners will be chosen randomly from everyone who has submitted. I'm probably going to do a short Instagram live stream on that. Last call for submissions is the 11th of December. I'm really looking forward to what you're going to do with this sound. Thanks Stefan for having me and Kasper for organizing this. I had a great time at the Signal Labor. And that's it for this video. If you would like to support what I do, there's the Patreon or you can buy my music on Bandcamp. And if you have any questions, do leave in the comments below or visit the subreddit. I'll be seeing you in the next one. Bye.